What's going on everybody? Tom here with Black Sheep Keto and welcome to another free recipe video just for you subscribers out there. And if you're not a subscriber yet and you want to help with this channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring the bell to be notified when any more awesome keto recipes come out so that you can try them out for yourself. Now today we're making an updated version to my keto bread recipe. A lot of people love this thing. It's probably my most viewed and most liked recipe that I've ever made. I hear some great comments from a lot of people, but unfortunately for a lot of my international viewers, the recipes were done in US cups and various things like that, which made it kind of hard for them to convert. So today I went through and completely reformulated the recipe so it is different than the original recipe. And I'm gonna be giving everything in grams to make it more precise and less error prone. So for this recipe, I had three main goals. First of all, I wanted to get the bake time down just a little bit. Secondly, I wanted to make a bigger loaf and third of all, I wanted to make it a little bit drier and a little easier to tear apart because the first one I found could be a little bit wet in some circumstances and uh, ripping it apart, it really clung together quite well, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I wanted to make this a little bit different. And like last time, I'm gonna go ahead and explain kind of what I'm doing and why. So if that is not your favorite style of video that I make, go ahead and check in the description box there. You'll see a link to the full written recipe, macros, all of that. Feel free to just click on that and you know not watch the video. But if you guys are interested in why I'm using ingredients and how they impact the recipe, hang on tight and let's get right into it. So let's get started here. In this bowl here, I have 225 grams of almond flour. This is the blanched almond flour. It is super fine. Then I have 70 grams of coconut flour. Yes, I do like to use a blend of almond and coconut flour. I feel like the coconut flour um, is a little bit finer and fills in the gaps between the almond flour. Then we have 40 grams of golden flaxseed. Uh, this is ground golden flaxseed. I like the golden better than the regular flaxseed. I feel like it has a much milder taste. So go and get 40 grams of that golden flax. Next up, we have 15 grams of psyllium husk powder. I know a lot of people kind of have an adversity to uh, psyllium husk. I like this stuff because it really gives the bread a great texture. Now, unfortunately, like if you get a really crappy brand of it, sometimes it will taste a little bit gritty, but there's not very much in here. And sometimes it also will turn the bread a little bit purple. Uh, it all depends on the brand that you get. I'll go ahead and link one in the written recipe that I use, and I haven't had any problems with it tasting gritty or turning it any weird colors. But again, 15 grams psyllium husk powder. Next up, we have eight grams of cream of tartar. Now, a lot of people asked me in the last video if they can leave this out or what it's for. It is a dry acid. It's gonna be one of the things activating our baking soda. No, you cannot leave it out, and I don't know of a good substitute. It's a dry acid. There aren't a lot of them that I'm aware of that have a similar pH, so um, yeah, go ahead and just use cream of tartar. I can't guarantee what'll happen if you try to substitute it. So this is eight grams of cream of tartar. Next up, you may have guessed, is our baking soda. This is just nine grams of baking soda, not baking powder, baking soda. Baking soda is a lot more powerful and potent than baking powder. So um, what we're actually doing is creating our own leavening blend with the cream of tartar, some vinegar, and the baking soda. If you just swap it for baking powder, it's not gonna rise, and you also don't need those other acids. In any case, use baking soda, and this is nine grams of it. Then we've got six grams of pink Himalayan sea salt. And lastly, seven grams of dry active yeast. Now I am gonna talk a little bit about this one as well. A lot of people in the last recipe, even though I told them that it wasn't the case, um, seem to think that the yeast has something to do with the bread. It has absolutely nothing to do with the bread. Uh, yeast actually needs to eat sugars or starches to produce carbon dioxide, right? So without any sugars or starches in the bread, the yeast does absolutely nothing. What I like putting it in there for is the flavor because yeast does have a pretty distinct flavor to it. And I feel like adding a little bit of it to this bread helps kind of trick your brain into thinking that this is a real bread. Now again, I'm gonna say it does nothing to help it rise. It has no sugars and no starches to eat. So it's literally just there for flavor. So if you don't wanna put it in there, you don't have to, but I like it again for the flavor. So now we have everything in our dry ingredient bowl. By the way, I'm using a massive bowl for this and you'll see why. In any case, just go ahead and mix this up really well. This is your chance to mix really, really well. So just make sure it is combined as thoroughly as possible. All the clumps are broken up all of that fun stuff. Well, that handles our dry ingredients, so I'll be right back with all of our wet ingredients. Another note, I'm going to be giving the weight of these uh, wet ingredients here. That's not a very common thing to do, but since some countries use milliliters, here in the US we use fluid ounces, and when you're measuring by volume in cups, you can actually be off by quite a bit, especially with certain types of uh, measuring devices. In any case, it made more sense since we want this to be as precise as possible. 
to just go ahead and give the weight of the liquid since the weight of the liquid is universal. Now to start things off, we have 300 grams of warm water. And the only reason that water needs to be warm is if you look at um, golden flaxseed, put a little bit in cold water and put a little bit in warm water, you'll notice that there's actually a difference in consistency. We want that kind of warmer consistency. You'll notice the difference if you try it. Moving on, we have one whole egg. We have five egg whites and all these come from large eggs. Now that may sound like a lot of egg whites, but remember I did make this recipe quite a bit bigger than the original. So it is a total of six eggs, one whole egg, five egg whites. Moving on, we have 25 grams of apple cider vinegar. This is part of that leavening mixture that's gonna help activate that baking soda. And lastly, I have nine grams of extra virgin olive oil. Now we're just gonna mix this thoroughly, make sure all the eggs are beaten, everything looks uh, basically the same color consistency. You don't want any stringy bits of egg. Just mix this until it is super well combined. Now it is time for the moment you guys have all been waiting for, combining our wet and dry ingredients. So let me talk a little bit about this first, and I'm sorry if I'm kind of rambling on here, but this is a point where I saw a lot of people mess up the last recipe. When you mix these together, it is a very quick, fast, aggressive mix. You wanna get everything combined before the baking soda really starts to activate and cause it to rise. If you mix it for too long, um, you're gonna whip all that air out of there and then you're basically gonna have a brick and we don't want that, we want a lot of air. And since this is our one opportunity to keep that air in there, baking soda only activates once, we wanna go ahead and get in there as quick as we can, aggressively mix it all together. And I'm actually gonna shoot this in real time so you can see how little I'm actually mixing this. That's it, I'm done, no more mixing. Now you're gonna notice if you watch this, and I may even put like a little time lapse here, this is starting to rise quite a bit. And as it's rising, that we're gonna you know, have that baking soda activate, it's going to cause it to lift, and then the coconut flour is gonna start sucking up all of that moisture and basically solidify it in that leavened position, which is kind of the whole trick behind this recipe. So once it's like this, don't mess with it, let it hang out here. There's a reason I haven't preheated my oven yet, and it's so that we give it enough time for the coconut flour to absorb that moisture. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and preheat my oven to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. Once it beeps, this is basically ready to start forming our dough. So let me do that, and I'll catch up with you when it's time to form the loaf of bread. So the oven just beeped, and it has reached 375 degrees Fahrenheit, and this has just been sitting here this whole time. Now if we give it a wiggle, you'll see it doesn't really move, and that's because that coconut flour soaked up pretty much all of our moisture, and that's what we're aiming for here. So now it is time to make the loaf. And compared to the last recipe, I found the easiest way to keep the most air in the dough as possible is just by using a wooden spoon and scooping it and just kind of plopping it in the center. Shouldn't say plop, you're not trying to like smash it down, but just gently set it in the middle. So I'll show you guys how I do that real quick. Now you can make this whatever shape you want, but since I am gonna be using this to make like sandwiches and things like that, I tend to just make a very tall tower in the center and it'll spread out a little bit, but give it some height if you wanna make sandwiches. If you don't and you just wanna make like, I don't know, a baguette, that's what I was looking for. Um, if you're trying to make a baguette, you can lay it out in that shape too, but since we're making sandwiches, just pile it as tall as you want. Now for me, since I'm gonna be photographing this and I want it to look pretty, I'm gonna to wanna to smooth out these edges. You can tell it's kind of like a, a little bit rough from just packing the dough on there. Since I want this to look really pretty for the photos, I'm gonna use get my hands a little bit wet and smooth that out. Anytime you manipulate this dough, you are working some air out of it. So if you're gonna do this, just be careful. It's not really necessary, but if you want the bread to be pretty, this is what you do. And there you have it. This is my uh, loaf right here. It's kind of that tombstone shape I was talking about in the last video. And I'm gonna go ahead and put this in that 375 degree Fahrenheit oven for between 65 and 75 minutes. You'll notice I raised the temperature and brought down the bake times just a little bit, even though we're making a bigger loaf. So that should be a win for some of you guys who didn't like the bake time. Anyway, 375 degrees Fahrenheit, 65 to 75 minutes. And I will kind of stop and show you guys as I pull it out of the oven since some people complained about that last time. Anyway, I'll get this in the oven and I'll catch up with you guys in just a little bit. Now, in the previous video, I will say, some of the uh, fellow members of our little flock of black sheep had their tinfoil hats on just a little bit too tight and were accusing me of swapping the bread out for a store-bought variety. And if you can't tell by the pile of failures there and uh, the fact that I would just never do that and you probably would be able to tell if I had, I'm gonna go ahead and show you what it looks like coming out of the oven. 
Would you look at that, guys? Would you, would you just look at that? These things are absolutely perfect. Don't ask how I got two of them out of one loaf. Don't ask questions. It looks perfect. All right, everybody. So now that this has been out of the oven, I went ahead and put it on a little drying rack, as you can see here. This is the actual loaf of bread, just, you know, for any clarity there. It's on a drying rack because um, what can happen is as you're letting it cool down, a little bit of condensation can form between the loaf of bread and the parchment paper, and it makes your bottom crust there just a little bit soggy. Not the end of the world, but if you want to avoid that, just pick it up and move it to a little drying rack. And just like the last time, let this thing cool down completely before you slice it. There have been a lot of comments about that as well. Let it cool completely. Otherwise, um, the inside of it's gonna feel a little bit mushy. This is because as it's cooling down, it's releasing a bit of steam here, and it's going to dry out the inside as that steam is released. Now, if you cut it early, again, it's gonna feel mushy. So just wait until it's completely cool to cut it. Not that hard, and that is gonna be the best, like most optimum keto bread, taste, texture, everything that you can get from this recipe. So with that, guys, I am gonna go and put the finished product on the screen right now, and then I will catch up with you all for the taste test. All right, everybody, now that you've seen the recipe and the finished product, we are here for the taste test. Now, on my plate here, I just have a small piece of the bread. It was a slice that I went ahead and cut vertically as well. Uh, and then I put a little bit of butter on there just for the purpose of this taste test. So let's go ahead and uh, give it a bite. So I think we need to talk about this from two fronts. First of all, the taste. The taste is pretty much exactly like a real bread that you can imagine. That yeast really does a good job of mimicking the taste of a real bread, and that is totally why I put it in there. Second thing we're gonna talk about is the texture. Now, this doesn't have the same kind of like fluffy, airy texture that you get from a real yeast leavened bread. What it does is it feels like something like a banana bread or a zucchini bread. It's a little denser, a little more moist, but it's still nice, light, fluffy, airy. They make great sandwiches, that kind of stuff. But when you make this, don't expect that really fluffy kind of wonder bread, you could squish it down into a ball the size of your fist type of bread. It's gonna be denser, it feels more like a banana bread, but it tastes like a regular bread. Just in full disclosure for you guys. So if that sounds good to you guys and you wanna make this yourself, again, the full written recipe and macros are gonna be down in the description box below. If you have any questions, comments, anything like that for myself, go and leave them down in the comment section. Make sure you like this video, and if you have not subscribed yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button so I can see you in the next one.